I was recently digging through files of the British National Archives at Kew when I came across something quite by accident, a file pertaining to an extraordinary and seemingly unknown plot to have made the Duke of Windsor, the former King of England, king once again. But not of Great Britain, but of Germany. Searching the published biographies of the Duke of Windsor, this interesting little 1946 plot has seemingly been overlooked by historians and journalists, so I present it here for the first time. In order to understand how the plot came about, it is necessary to understand something of the circumstances that led to the Duke of Windsor being an ex-king, possibly for hire. Known as David to his family, he had succeeded to the British throne in 1936 upon the death of his father, King George V. David reigned as King Edward VIII and was also Emperor of India. A popular figure, Edward had been a playboy Prince of Wales whose only real interest appeared to have been sleeping with other men's wives. Then he met Wallace Warfield Simpson, a twice-divorced American, and fell deeply in love. There was a genuine fear in the British establishment that Edward might marry Wallace and make her his queen. She was completely unacceptable to the establishment and the Church of England because of her divorces and because she was American and ignorant of court life. Edward became king the year Hitler began testing the waters regarding his plans for German expansion in Europe. Edward was, as has been noted by many who knew him, a natural fascist and stated that he felt more German than English, being fluent in the language. In fact, Edward was more German than English. His mother being Princess Mary of Teck, a German princely state, and his late father, King George V, being almost completely German. His father, Edward VII, was the son of Queen Victoria, a Hanoverian princess, and Prince Albert of saxe coburg und Gotha. George V's mother was Alexandra of Denmark, herself mostly German. So, by ancestry, King Edward VIII was almost entirely German, with a slight dash of Hungarian from his mother's side. Therefore, his love of all things German was understandable. What was less understandable was his admiration for Adolf Hitler. When Hitler sent troops into the Rhineland in 1936, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, he expected some military reaction from France and Britain. But evidence has emerged that Edward threatened to precipitate an abdication crisis if Britain stood up to Hitler. Britain and France did nothing, emboldening Hitler to more territorial grabs and putting Europe on the road to war in 1939. Even more worrisome for the British establishment was Edward's evident unfitness to be king. Hitler's ambassador to Great Britain before the war was Joachim von Ribbentrop, who formed a close, and some say extremely close, relationship with Wallace Simpson. He mentioned information at a diplomatic reception that could only have come from secret cabinet meetings. The monarch receives state papers the same as the prime minister does, and these confidential reports should not be shared with anyone. However, it was clear that Edward had told Wallace about confidential information, and that she in turn had told von Ribbentrop. If anyone else had done such a thing, a charge of treason would have been contemplated. This and other problems with Edward led to a plot developing among the establishment to get rid of Edward as king. The plotters used the issue of Edward's stated wish to marry Mrs. Simpson as the pretext, and Edward foolishly played straight into their hands by giving the government an ultimatum. Either he would marry Wallace or he would abdicate. The Prime Minister chose the latter option, and Edward abdicated after barely a year on the throne, his brother Bertie taking over as King George VI. Edward and Wallace went to France and married. Though Edward was not banished officially from Britain, he nonetheless entered a period of self-imposed exile that would last for most of his life until his death in 1972. The problem for the British government was Edward's continued interest in Hitler. In 1937, he and Wallace visited Germany, actually meeting Hitler at the Berghof. What Hitler and Edward discussed has never been fully revealed, but Hitler definitely saw Edward as a friend of Germany. When war broke out, Edward, now titled the Duke of Windsor, was attached as a major general to the British military mission in France. 
According to German sources, Edward had leaked Allied war plans for the defence of Belgium to the Germans, helping Hitler's 1940 invasion. Fleeing France ahead of the Germans, Edward and Wallace set up a house in neutral Lisbon in Portugal, where the Duke became the focus of a kidnap plot conducted by the SS called Operation Vili in order to place Edward under German intelligence control during a critical stage of the war in 1940, when Britain and her empire stood alone. Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered Edward to return to Britain, threatening a court-martial if he refused. Thereafter, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were packed off to the British colony of the Bahamas in the Caribbean, with Edward appointed governor to keep him out of harm's way. He remained in that post until March 1945, when he started making noises about some future role. In September, Edward and Wallace returned to Europe, she to reopen their old French mansion, which, incredibly, had been carefully guarded by the German army during the occupation of France and he to Britain to see his mother, Queen Mary, for the first time in nine years, and his brother, King George VI. During the meeting, it was made clear to Edward that his wife would not be received by the royal family, and that he would not be given any further jobs. Though Edward was independently extremely wealthy, he desired above all two things some useful role, and the granting of the title HRH or Her Royal Highness to his wife, specifically denied her. Whilst all this was going on, the royal family had enacted a secret mission to Germany to retrieve a series of letters and documents held in the archives of their German cousins at Marburg Castle in order to keep potentially damaging information about the royal family out of the newspapers. Among the documents were German intelligence files on the Duke of Windsor and his Nazi ties that would have proven damaging to the royal family if published. I've covered this mission in a separate video, link in the end screen. Naturally, both the royal family and the British government would have preferred it if Edward stayed in France doing the celebrity party circuit, but Edward was fairly thick-skinned and kept pushing. And, from this unsatisfactory state of affairs, emerged the curious plot that I found in the archives apparently overlooked. With the defeat of Germany in May 1945 came the dissolution of Germany as a nation-state, and its division into four occupation zones, American, British, French and Soviet. It was governed by the Allied Control Commission, made up of representatives of the four powers. The British section controlled much of northwestern Germany. The British political division based in Lübeck received a letter in December 1945 addressed to Edward from Count Bentinck, a member of the famous noble family of diplomats, asking whether the Duke of Windsor would be prepared to accept the throne. Not of Britain, but the throne of Hanover. This letter came out of the blue and was something of a shock to the British authorities. The Bentinck letter went on to explain that, quote, After Germany's fatal experiences during the last 25 years, many people in Germany believe that a British form of constitutional monarchy would be the most suitable form of government. Bentinck added that, quote, The personality of the Duke would certainly appeal to the German people, end quote. Hanover and Britain have, of course, a long history. In 1714, following the end of the Scottish Stuart dynasty in Britain, the Elector of Hanover was crowned as King George I of Great Britain, Ireland and Hanover, beginning a personal union between Britain and Hanover that lasted until 1837, when the two houses' personal union ended, though Queen Victoria, who succeeded to the British throne that year, was nonetheless a Hanoverian princess. The Duke of Windsor remained by descent from Queen Victoria, closely related to the Dukes of Hanover. In Germany, the various German dukedoms, kingdoms and principalities had been united in 1871 to form Germany, with the King of Prussia made Emperor or Kaiser. Then, at the conclusion of World War I in 1918, the German monarchy was abolished and Hanover became part of the Weimar Republic but the old ruling Hanoverian family retained their estates and castles and their position at the top of society. Many of the princes and dukes of Germany actively collaborated with Hitler before and during World War II. 
not the least of which were the Hanoverian royals, now the Dukes of Brunswick, or in German, Herzog von Braunschweig. Ernest Augustus, Duke of Brunswick, was the grandson of the last king of Hanover, and also a prince of the United Kingdom until stripped of that title in 1917 during World War I. During the Nazi period, Ernest Augustus donated funds to the Nazi party and was close friends with several senior Nazi leaders. He desired peace between Germany and Britain. The Duke of Windsor was also his friend and had stayed with his cousin in 1937. In 1945, Brunswick had lost one of his castles to the Soviets, but aided by his cousin, King George VI, British troops had been ordered to transfer the castle's contents and Brunswick family property to his other castle at Marienburg in the British occupation zone. However, the family was tainted by its association with the Nazis. Brunswick's son and heir, Ernest Augustus, Prince of Hanover, had briefly been an SS officer and later served in the army on the Eastern Front and was also imprisoned following the July plot against Hitler. Count Bentinck's extraordinary letter of December 1945, offering the crown of Hanover to the Duke of Windsor, was politely rebuffed by the curious expedient of Germans not being allowed to send letters abroad at this time. In the meantime, the actual person behind the plot appeared to show himself. On the 5th of November 1946, the British authorities were made aware of an article published in the magazine World Affairs by famous editor and writer Kenneth de Courcy. The article concerned the state of occupied Germany and its future, and outlined the idea of the British turning its occupation zone into a realm, that is, a royal realm, with someone appointed as king. Quote, Parliamentary democracy will never function in Germany unless this is done. Otherwise, there will be chaos ending in dictatorship or dictatorship ending in chaos. End quote. De Courcy believed constitutional monarchy to be the best type of government and the British model the finest example in the world. As for who should be the new monarch, quote, it would not be difficult to find him, wrote de Courcy, an able man, thoroughly accustomed to constitutional practice, acquainted with world problems, and with a political flair ought not to be hard to find from amongst the exalted personages in the royal circle of Europe. It would, of course, be a great mistake to have a German. It must be someone who knows America and Britain, and who has the support of them both, end quote. The man isn't named in the article, but it isn't difficult to work out who de Courcy might have thought had the right qualifications and was free. Major Brammer of the political division in Lübeck drew the government's attention to the de Courcy article, and also noted that de Courcy had told him that he had recently lunched with the Duke of Windsor. Even more interestingly, Brammer learnt that de Courcy was in Germany to meet with the Duke of Brunswick and another unnamed Duke at Glücksburg Castle. As Glücksburg was the family seat of the Dukes of Schleswig-Holstein, the unnamed noble may have been Wilhelm Friedrich, Duke of Schleswig-Holstein, but this remains speculation on my part. Count Bentinck's curious offer of the crown of Hanover to the Duke of Windsor now made sense. De Courcy had evidently pitched the idea to a frustrated Edward, then in France, as a way back into a useful position, to be a king once again, and of a part of a nation that Edward loved and respected in the time of its greatest need. And Wallace would be his queen, gaining the full royal status that Edward had desired so badly for his wife, and which the King of England, George VI, had specifically denied her. Edward was of Hanoverian blood and de Courcy's meeting with the Duke of Brunswick must have been to clear the way for Edward to have the crown. Edward and Wallace had no children, so perhaps it was intended that upon Edward's death the crown would go to the Duke of Brunswick's son or his grandson, both of whom were princes of Hanover. Edward was due to go to America, and the British Foreign Office minutes record that there was some disquiet that he might be seeking US support for de Courcy's plan to put him on the throne of Hanover. However, ultimately de Courcy and Edward's plan came to naught. King George VI and his government were determined that Edward would be kept out of any position and sidelined. 
and what remains of the papers concerning the Hanover plot suggests that the idea was dismissed as nonsense by the Foreign Office, at least officially, and allowed to fall into obscurity. Even though declassified in 1977, five years after the Duke of Windsor's death, the story of the plot remains largely unknown today and unremarked upon by historians. But I think that it demonstrates that Edward was prepared to examine any avenues to a return to public life. Many thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.